Good morning and namaste to all our viewers from the Consulate General of India in New York. Uh, as we know that we are celebrating Azadi Kamrut Mahotsav, which is the celebration of completion of 75 years of India's independence. And uh, as part of this celebration, the series of celebration, we are also celebrating the unsung heroes of India's freedom movement. And uh, one of the most important names in this, uh, uh, in this uh, category is that of Lala Hardayal Mathur, or uh, who's popularly known as Lala Hardayal, who was born in New Delhi and who passed away on the same day, March 4th, 1939, 84 years ago, in the city of Philadelphia in the United States. So today we are going to remember the life and legacy of Lala Hardayal. And uh, on this occasion, we have none other than uh, Dr. Bhuvan Lal, who is uh, a biographer of not just Lala Hardayal, but several others, uh, big names, most important names in India's freedom struggle. And uh, he's going to deliver a talk on Lala Hardayal and his life. And uh, the talk will be followed by a question and answer session. I request all our viewers to put in their questions in the chat box, which will be uh, put up before the speaker. And just to begin the program, uh, we go to our Consul General, Sri Ranthi Jaiswal, who will deliver the welcome remarks. Sir, please. Namaste, dear friends. Good evening and namaste, Dr. Lal. Thank you for accepting our invitation and for joining us in this virtual conversation on the life and legacy of Lala Hardial. You know, Lala Hardial is a towering personality, is a person who contributed in so many ways to India's freedom struggle and to India's development and progress as a nation. My own engagement with Lala Hardial started long, long years back when I was in school. There's a public library named after him in Chandni Chowk. And whenever I would cross that area, I would wonder who this gentleman was or is. And that's how I got researching about him. From there to now, I hold very high regard for him as a scholar, as a freedom fighter, as a person who had, who was a multifaceted personality. And more on that, of course, we'll have Dr. Lal telling us. Uh, Dr. Lal is an author, a scholar, a storyteller. He has been engaging with the subject of Gadar Party, revolutionaries, Lala Hardyar for many years now. And I'm sure he is so much to tell. The idea behind this and several of such series of events is that how do we bring a community <laughs> close to a history that is our own here in the United States. And as part of that, and as part of Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav, we've had several programs bringing out the connections of our freedom fighters with the United States of America, which in the case of Lala Hardyal, who was exiled out of India, happens to be even more deeper because he stayed here for many, many years and he passed away close to us here in Philadelphia. I hope after this meeting, we'll get several leads engaging our community, from our community, as to how we can resurrect this honorable and proud legacy of Lala Hardyal. So with that, I welcome you all once again, and we look forward to the conversation, to the talk by Dr. Lal. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Lal, now over to you. Thank you, Vipalji. Thank you, Randhir. Uh, it's been so nice. I was uh, really honored to speak here earlier on several occasions and uh, as recently as January when we did a show and a Zoom uh, event about Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose in which his daughter joined in from Germany. So uh, it's always nice to be back. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to show and share a video. So if George can play the video, uh, we can uh, begin immediately after that.
Yeah, are we done? <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think there was some video issue with the gray band in it, but anyway, thank you. Um, dear friends, I know you're connecting from all over the world. I can see people from California. I can see people from East Coast, India, Europe. Today is 4th of March. 4th of March, uh, 1939 was the day when the world lost Ardeyal. I will take you to 9th February, 1911. That was the day when the US Immigration Authority interviewed a man about five and a half feet in top tall, 27 years, visiting the United States for the first time. He was traveling from the Caribbeans. As per the records of the US immigration, he was heading towards Boston. He was intending to study at Harvard. When Hardyal landed in North America and United States in New York City. The Indian freedom movement was yet to begun, be, begin and become what it eventually became. The partition of Bengal had taken place. All the news about India was essentially fed through London. There were just about 7,000 Indians living in United States at that time. Ardyal came to Harvard. He had heard of Harvard. He was inspired by Swami Vivekananda. And he thought America would be a country where he could base himself to launch the freedom movement. Harvard had only about four or five Indian students at that time. They had a very strong philosophy department. And Professor Woods and Landman were known globally as authorities on Indian spirituality. They interviewed Hardyal. At that time, Hardyal wanted to do a PhD in Buddhism. Both the faculty members realized that it was not going to be easy for them to deal with a man of this intellectual stature. They suggested he goes to the West Coast because there was a professor on the West Coast called Arthur Ryder, teaching at Berkeley, who was considered the top intellectual of North America at that time. Hardyal, while being in Harvard, also met a learned Indian called Santeja Singh. Santeja Singh knew of Hardyal and knew what he was up to in India in the previous years. He also suggested that Hardyal moves to California because a lot of Indians were working there in the farms, in other jobs across the state. Eventually, Hardyal came to California in the summer of 1911. He started giving speeches. His best friend, Bhai Parmanand had reached California to study pharmacology. They would book halls and Hardyal would go out and deliver a lecture. Slowly and steadily, most of San Francisco had heard of Hardyal, this Indian saint who lives very simply, speaks brilliantly and knows so much. Arthur Ryder met Ardeal at Berkeley multiple times. Arthur Ryder spent three years in Banaras studying Sanskrit. It was said he was one of the few people on earth who could form a civilization. He was a man of great depth. But on meeting Ardeal, 
a 27 year old indian he realized he had met somebody of much greater stature than him he wrote to the president of stanford the knowledge hardial has of eastern spirituality is such that no westerner can ever gain it his english is impeccable he studied at oxford there was another professor at berkeley called arthur pope who also wrote to stanford saying the same thing and adding hardial was the greatest indian of that time stanford university in march 19 12 exactly 111 years ago did something that had never happened before in north america they hired an indian to teach at the university hardial became the first indian to be employed by an american university to teach and exactly 111 years ago on 5th march 1912 hardial entered a classroom on the university of stanford to teach for the first time his name and fame spread all over america new york times published a story four days later faculty elects a hindu at that time anybody coming from india was called a hindu and it was a rarity to find somebody of indian origin going as far as teaching at a university hardial had broken the glass ceiling lala lajpat rai who spent 4 5 years during the first world war in north america and specifically in new york and west west coast has written hardial was the greatest indian to have visited united states of america who was hardial why was north america impressed with him why did stanford hire him hardial was born in a middle class household in a small street called chira khana of naisadak in old delhi very humble background the only way to go forward was to study and from this background very early on this small boy started visiting the libraries and the librarians would be very concerned why would this boy come here and take all these books from us and then give them back to us so one day the librarian asked him do you know what this book is about and you just took it and you brought it back and to the librarian's amazement hardial started reading from the book without looking at it he had remembered the whole book hardial's astonishing mind was unbelievable for that time his command over multiple languages was unheard of he wrote an article in a newspaper of that time as a college student from st stephen's college that article created a wave across the country it was published in modern review tej bahadur sapru one of the top lawyers of ilahabad read that article and he said how can somebody write this article let us find this writer who is this guy along with the publisher of that magazine he reached delhi and they located hardial at his house tej bahadur sapru was among the top lawyers in the country and he was amazed to see a 17 year old person with the capability of a kind that had never been seen in the country not only was he completely in control of the language the idea he was putting forward the social conquest of the hindu race 
by the British Empire had never been tackled before. And he was only 17. Hardyal impressed the school, college students of that era. When he appeared in the final exams, he had to answer only six questions out of 12. Hardyal answered all 12 and wrote, check any six. He topped the exam. He topped every exam. His memory was legendary. He completed his BA from St. Stephen's College, moved to Lahore to complete an MA. His professors over there were astonished. They gave him books to read as part of the syllabus. And next day he walked into the classroom. He had remembered the whole book. Nobody had ever seen a person like Ardeyal. When he would walk on the streets of Lahore, people would say, Wo ja hai Ardeyal. His name was fame was spreading all over North India. While he was an academically inclined person, what was not known to the public was he was deeply nationalistic. He was member of a secret society in Delhi. They were quietly plotting the overthrow of the British Empire. The British had yet to come to a complete understanding of this man. Hardeyal organized a group of young students in Lahore University. And to launch that group, he called one of his professors to give a speech. That professor was a professor of philosophy in Punjab University at that time, government college. And he was a well-known poet. So he said, I will not give a speech. I will just recite my latest poem. And at that gathering, he sang that song that is still sung across the country. Sare jahan se achha Hindustan humara. Professor Iqbal thought Hardyal was the most brilliant student he ever had. After Hardyal topped and became the first first divisioner in a master's program in India, the British government decided to send him to Oxford. They gave him an unbelievable scholarship. In financial terms, it would be close to one crore rupees today. For a middle-class person from an ordinary family, it was a huge deal. He was the first North Indian to be sent on a scholarship to Oxford. Nobody had ever gained this kind of scholarship. But there was a problem. He had to appear in an interview. And there was a police report by now. It was an intelligence report that claimed that Hardyal was also involved in kind of revolutionary activities on the side. At this juncture, the principal of St. Stephen's College came to his rescue and wrote a letter that Hardyal was primarily an academically minded student and his stay in Oxford would only enhance his capabilities. There was also a British professor at uh, St. Stephen's College, Charles Andrews, Dean Bandhu Charles Andrews, who had just arrived. He found Hardyal fascinating. He spent many hours with Hardyal, many days with Hardyal. He, in fact, wanted Hardyal to go to Cambridge instead of Oxford. Eventually, Hardyal reached Oxford. On his arrival, he won two more scholarships. This is the year 1905. For the first time in the British papers, a news appeared that Hardyal had won two scholarships. Now he was competing with the world's best. People from all over the world had come to study in Oxford. The professors over there had seen everything that had ever come on earth. England was at the zenith of its empire. Imperialism dominated planet Earth. 
Oxford has shown me transcripts of that period in which Hardyal set up the Majlis Debating Society. Those transcripts are still there. He became an excellent debater. He was an eloquent speaker. He could speak in six languages by now. Hardyal also had a very unusual capability. His ability to write in English was astounding. British professors have written on the sides of his tutorials. We can't improve upon Hardyal. He writes better than us. Of course, the next big step for Hardyal was to appear in the Indian Civil Service exam and become a member of the British Empire. A 16-year-old son of a top lawyer from Allahabad was studying in Haru at that time. His name was Jawahar Lal Nehru. In his autobiography, he has written that I went to London twice to hear Hardyal. He had made such a name for himself in Oxford. KPS Menon, who became Secretary General of the Indian Foreign Service and later on even ambassador to Russia and China, came to Oxford in 1920, 15 years after Hardyal. And he said, everyone in his autobiography is mentioned, everyone talked about Hardyal. That name was still there. With this kind of mind, walking through the Indian Civil Service exam was child's play for Hardyal. But by now, he had become member of the India House. And he had two new friends, Shamji Krishna Varma and Veer Savarkar. Hardyal was not going to appear in the ICS exam. He had chosen a path, a revolutionary path. He was going to fight for India's independence. The British intelligence had narrowed down on three people as the greatest troublemakers of that time. Suri Arbindo Ghosh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, and Hardyal. Hardyal, at that time, employed his genius to understand how to dismantle the British Empire. He knew the British used India essentially as a treasure chest. They were looting us. Billions of dollars worth of Indian wealth was being transferred to Britain. And they had two instruments. The first instrument was the Indian Civil Service, which was collecting the revenues and managing the law and order within the country. And the second, more dangerous instrument was the British Indian Army which was being employed in a dictatorial manner to control India. This was also a time when Britain was celebrating 50 years of the first independence, war of independence of India, which they called the mutiny, 1857. Savarkar had written a book calling it the first war of independence. The book had yet to be published. Even before it was published, it was banned. The idea now was, and that is the genius of Ardeal. He realized, understood, the way forward was to recreate the rebellion of 1857 in the British Indian Army, the Qadar. In 1908, January, Ardiyal left for India. 
He took up a house in Lahore. He started creating his movement. He lived very simply. You must understand at that time, anybody who returned from Oxford or England or even visited England would come back as a what they call a pakka Britisher. They would wear hats, they would wear suits, they would walk and talk like the British did. It was very fashionable. But Hardial was the exact opposite. While he was in London, he was walking on Oxford Street, dressed in kurta pajama and used to talk to the British shopkeepers in Sanskrit. And of course, when he was in India, he retained his senses and remained Indian, as Indian as a person can get. Between, 19, uh, between January 1908 and July 1908, the British intelligence service was trailing Ardeal day and night. They had a thick file on him now. They watched every step of this. And they wanted to implicate him in something or the other so that he would land in jail. One day he was attending a wedding in Lahore. And a message came through Lala Rajpat Rai that arrest warrant is about to be issued for you. If you can escape this, please escape. By now, Hardial was married. His wife had also come to London and come back with him from England. They were expecting a baby any day. But Hardial had to make a choice. It was either Kalapani or the freedom of India. He very quietly moved to Mumbai, Bombay, took a ship to Colombo and reached England. From that day onwards, 15th August 1908, when he left India, he never returned to India. He was exiled forever. The next 30 years of his life were spent overseas. He never met his wife again. He never saw his daughter who was born three days after his departure. Hardial roamed around London, Paris, Switzerland, Algeria, almost with nothing in his pocket. There were days when he didn't eat any food. All along, he was being tracked by the British intelligence. Then there was this huge event of Madan Lal Khurana. Madan Lal. Dhingra. And the British Empire suddenly realized the Indian students studying in Europe and specifically in London were a great danger to their empire. They thought Veer Savarkar was the man they needed to arrest. Veer Savarkar moved to Paris. Bikaji Kama used to run the Indian paper there. Hardial was the editor of the paper. One day, Savarkar decided to go back to London. His best friend Hardial told him, don't do this. They will arrest you. They will send you to Kalapani. This is not the time to be brave. We'll find another occasion, a time of our choosing. Savarkar looked in the eyes of Hardeyal. There were tears. He boarded the train and reached London. He was arrested. Even though he tried to escape, he was sent to Kalapani for 50 years. Hardial, by now, very disappointed, dischanted by everything, suddenly left everything and moved to the Caribbean, so far away from the clutches of the British Empire that nobody would ever be able to find him. He started meditating on the island of Martinique, which was owned by the French. He lived there in isolation. His ideal was Buddha. 
and it was here by chance bhai parmanand arrived one day and bhai parmanand went to the post office to find out if there was any indian living on that island and he was told there is an indian living in the island but he spends most of his time in the forest bhai parmanand's french was not perfect martinique the official language was french with some difficulty he managed to find someone who could take him to that man in the forest finally somebody appeared hardyal was meditating he heard that someone was looking for him in the city hardyal was worried maybe the british empire's agents have come to arrest him he was pleasantly surprised to see his best friend just like savarkar bhai parmanand was one of his closest states and they embraced and bhai parmanand spent the next one month with hardyal at martinique thinking through what was happening on earth and what could they do to save their motherland from the enslavement of the british inspired by bhai parmanand he came to america in 1911 and reached stanford now we turn to the most important part of the role of hardyal in the indian freedom movement while lala hardyal was in san francisco he saw the racism that the indians were facing at one level he was accepted in the intellectual society of north, north america. america the newspapers were writing about him the editors of the newspapers were his friends the top journalists the top writers they were writing about him jack london one of the top novelists of that period wrote a novel in which he created a character called hardyal he called him dar hayal he met the indians all across the west coast and the story was the same these were primarily people from north india sikh farmers who had come to america to seek a fortune but times were very tough they were not taken seriously they were given lowly jobs and they were mistreated the reason was they came from a country that was ruled by britain they were an enslaved country along with hardyal a lot of farmers and people of indian origin came together to form an indian association by the way by now hardyal was a well known entity within north america the british intelligence had posted a man in vancouver his name was william hopkinson he was a spy his job was to track all the indians of revolutionary nature on the west coast and he was reporting to calcutta and delhi his reports were being read by indian intelligence british indian intelligence he came to san francisco and he went to hear a lecture of hardyal in san francisco he was outstanding completely outstanding outstanding lecturer captivating speaker the audience was totally taken in well bound hopkinson reported to delhi that hardyal is the most dangerous man of indian origin in north america he has a group of students with him he is going to create trouble this was a moment when indians overseas did not have enough financial wherewithal to create a revolution or a rebellion hardyal had already thought this through he had employed his intellect 
to fight the British Empire. The richest, the mightiest, and the greatest empire the world had ever known. They were facing an Indian who had nothing except his intellect to fight with them. Hardyal approached the German Council in San Francisco and told them about his plans. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, is an old Indian style of war strategy. Ardeal employed it. He had been in England. He had seen how Indians were treated in England. In France, he had great friends, but he really saw how the Germans viewed India. They had translated Indian texts. They understood the Gita. They understood our epics. They had great value for our spirituality. The Germans helped Ardeal. And in California, he put together a newspaper. Around this time, he had the support of the Sikh community of North America. He was invited for the launch of the first Gurudwara that was built in North America. Sohan Singh Bakna became head of the Indian group. Ardeal became the general secretary. A distant relative of his and a good writer, Govind Bihari Lal appeared. He was studying in Berkeley. He became a support to Hardeyal. And he funded the launch of the newspaper in San Francisco, actually at Berkeley. The newspaper was called Qatar. It reminded its audience about 1857. It talked about freedom of India and demanded from the British Empire complete freedom. Several years before the Congress party ever thought of it, several years before the communist revolutionaries in India did anything about it, several decades before everybody else, Ardeyal's Qadar was the first time Indians wanted complete independence from British rule on planet Earth. William Hopkinson, British intelligence, immediately understood the gravity of the situation. They formed what is called IPI. That organization eventually became external intelligence department of the British Empire and is commonly now known as MI6. Around this time, a very big event took place in India. On 23rd of December, 1911, 1912, Delhi was redesignated as the capital of India and Lord Harding had made an appearance. He had arrived at Old Delhi Railway Station, mounted a huge elephant and a whole procession of Delhi elephants entered Chandni Chowk with the intention of going up to Red Fort to unfurl the flag of the British Empire, the Union Jack. As these 50 elephants caught onto Chandni Chowk, every single window, every single balcony, every single lamppost, every single spot on the street was taken. The entire city was witnessing us. There was a lot of fanfare. It was like a huge festival. Suddenly, there was a loud sound. A bomb was thrown at Lord Harding. The bomb narrowly missed Harding. Harding was badly injured. The procession had to be abandoned. And the entire group was disbanded. The world was in shock. 
the second most important person in the British Empire, the Viceroy in India, had been attacked in broad daylight and nobody had been caught. The top police officer from the British in Delhi, David Petrie, was made in charge of this investigation. A price of 25,000 rupees was announced. At that time, one could acquire a full bungalow in Delhi's civil lines for 5,000 rupees. That price was raised to 50,000 rupees. Still no answers. The amount was raised further to 1 lakh rupees. Still nobody could be caught. A year had passed. David Petrie was under great pressure to find who had tried? What was the conspiracy? The top detectives from the British intelligence from Calcutta had been called to Delhi. They were investigating. Scotland Yard was approached. French detectives were called. Finally, David Petrie ordered random raids across Delhi. Police started opening homes, walking into them and checking them out. And in one such home, in Old Delhi, the home of a very respected man called Amir Chand. They found a large bag, just kept on the side. They opened that bag. There were a lot of paperwork in the bag. It was all prohibited paperwork. One thing got his notice. It was a letter written to Amir Chand. It was an unsigned letter. David Petrie held that letter in his hand. That was the only proof of an involvement of a foreign source because the letterhead was intact. It read, University of California, Berkeley. Handwriting experts were employed. And it was quickly concluded, the handwriting belonged to none other than Ardeal. The British Foreign Office, the Canadian government started applying pressure on Americans to arrest and deport this man, the single biggest revolutionary of that period, now in California. But Ardeal was a genius. He had lived in Canada, in uh, California for more than three years now. He was in America for more than three years. He had applied for citizenship. Any person who had lived in North America for more than three years could not be legally deported. In February 1914, Hardial, along with two Indians, appeared in Washington demanding immigration for Indians. This was the first time formal immigration was demanded for Indians in the history of United States of America. And Hardial was one of those persons. Because he was noted for his revolutionary activities, he appeared independently. And the official record says that they were the entire team of immigration people, they had heard the plea of this very cultured Indian. Hardeyal by now realized that things would get only more difficult for him. He was giving a lecture at a certain place in San Francisco in the end of March, 1914. 
it was a publicized lecture. The police arrived there. They had orders to arrest him. When they walked in there and they saw 250 Americans in the hall, that was a time when it was difficult to get a gathering of 10 to 15 people in one room. And there were 250 Americans waiting to listen to this man who was described by the British as a ruffian. They very politely approached him. And they said, we have orders to arrest you. Ardial said, fine, but I have a lecture to give. Would it be fine if you could just attend this lecture and not disappoint the audience? And then maybe I could accompany you to wherever you want me to go. The police sat down and listened to the lecture. After the lecture, they were in no condition to arrest this man. They politely asked him to appear before them the next day because he was something else. The next day, Hardial appeared before the police. He was accompanied by 200 Indians who wanted to ensure no harm comes to the man they by now called the Maharaja of India. His outfit was called the Qadar Party. The membership was exceeding. It had reached all over the world. There were 50,000 Qadar patriots ready to return to India to launch the rebellion. The transcript of the interrogation of Hardial by the Americans is in public domain. It shows how classy this man was, how balanced his thinking was, how fine-tuned his capability was, and how deep his understanding of the world affairs as they were at that time is clearly visible in that transcript, and I've read it. Two days later, Hardial was a free man and went back to lecturing. The British were aghast. Hardial's legal aid was provided by an Italian lawyer in San Francisco. And that Italian lawyer basically felt that the British would make an attempt to either kidnap him or kill him now because they can't officially arrest him. And it would only be in the fitness of things that he disappears from San Francisco. In April 1914, Hardial quietly boarded a train and left North America. He had by now done exactly what he had intended to do, plant the seed of the Indian freedom movement, the Qatar party. Sohan Singh Bakra, Kartar Singh, Saraba, they all headed to India. Komagata Maru happened. Eventually, William Hopkinson was killed. The First World War began. Hardial was in Germany, he was in Switzerland, he was in Turkey. At the end of First World War, he was a disillusioned man. He had walked into the prisoners of war camps in Germany and met the Indian soldiers. And his entire non-sectarian approach was visible to them. He would sit and eat with them. He would sing Sare Jahan Se Achha with them. He would try to convince them to launch an army in India. After the war, he moved to Sweden. These were the lost years of his life. 1919 to 1927, he spent many years in Sweden. 1927, after trying very hard to return to India through some way or the other and not succeeding, because the British blocked his entry. 
he suddenly appeared in London. And he decided to live in London and complete his PhD. The University of London accepted him as a student and he started visiting the British Library. And over two years of just walking to the British Library and coming back, he completed what he always wanted to do, a PhD on Buddhism. The Buddhist doctrine in Pali literature. He translated a dead language of Pali into Sanskrit and delivered a PhD in English. His intellectual attainment was such that that book, that PhD thesis is considered the final work of that early years of Buddhism written by an Indian and now prescribed in universities all over the world, especially North America, as a text to study Buddhism, standard text to study Buddhism. It's a beautifully written book. He was also one of the first published authors of Indian origin in England. While in London, he came across Sartej Bahadur Sapuru, who had now become member of the Viceroy Council. And Sapuru Sab was now considered a legal luminary in the country. In London, he interviewed Hardyal. The last time he had met Hardyal when Hardyal was 17, now he was meeting him when he was in his 40s. By now, Hardyal spoke 17 languages, could teach in any one of them. He remembered 5,000 books by heart. There was nobody like him on planet Earth at that, of that style, that capability, and simple living, simple manners, a very cultured individual. He was also secretly involved in the revolutionary movement of India to the Arya Samaj. Then Teg Bahar Sapru asked him, do you want to come to India? He said, yes, I want to at some stage. I want to see my daughter. I want to see my family. Sartej Bahadur Sapru had come to London for a specific purpose and Hardyal knew about it. So he asked him, do you know this bill that I am now working on for the British Empire? Do you have any comments on it? Hardyal was not a legal person. He had never studied law. He pointed out 40 issues with the bill that had been prepared by Sartej Bahadur Sapru. He was amazed. He had never seen such a gifted person who could find 40 different issues with a piece of paper that he had spent months on working. And this man was not a legal person at all. Such was the fine tuning of the brain and the intellectual capability of Hardyal. In 1938, October 1938, Hardyal once again arrived in New York on a lecture tour. This was his second visit to North America. And while he was here, he received the news that the British Empire had decided to forgive him. And they were going to allow him to return to India only on one condition. He would never ever travel abroad. Hardyal spent that time between New York City and Philadelphia. He gave lectures everywhere. His lectures were reported in all the newspapers. New York Times specifically wrote about him. In 1919, at the end of the First World War, New York Times had written, Hardyal is not only the most intelligent man in the Indian Revolutionary Party, he's the most gifted. And that gift was intact. His lectures were outstanding. On March 3rd, 1939, Hardyal went to sleep in Philadelphia, never to wake up again. His last words were, I am at peace with myself. Three days later, a memorial was held for him in New York City. New York Times published his obituary. And by then, the baton had been passed to yet another man who would lead the third 
war of India's independence and head the Azad Hind Forge, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's. And the rebellion finally did happen and India finally did become free on 15th August, 1947. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Jai Hind, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lal. That was indeed a very riveting and engaging talk. And uh, I mean, time just flew. We didn't even realize, you know, how 50 minutes passed just like that. And we were, you know, loving so much the way you narrated the story of uh, Lala Hardayal's life. So, you know, just to begin the question and answer session, I will uh, put the first question to you. So as we know that he spent a lot of time in the United States, both on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. He traveled the country and he went to the universities. He interacted with the society, with the administration, with the civil society, with the government. So what was his view of the United States? And uh, did he ever write anything about, you know, the, the relationship between India and United States or the potential uh, between these two countries? Oh, uh, Hardyal was also a journalist. He was writing all the time. He's written tons of stuff about what the United States was about and how Indians were progressing here. He was very positive. He thought the university system was very engaging and people should have, I mean, all over India should go out and study in American universities. The scholarship system here was, at, even at that time, very uh, easy uh, to attain. And uh, primarily, his interactions with the, uh, the American universities led to a positive view about India because for years, uh, uh, that uh, person who had come from India and taught here, that image remained. And a number of American intellectuals and the university systems started taking India very seriously. Even when uh, you know, he passed away, the people who talked about him and wrote about him in the papers were the people who initiated the first immigration law in 1946. So he, his impact was very deep, extremely deep. And uh, uh, even now, Berkeley maintains a whole set of um, uh, you know, documents about Hardyal. Stanford University, in fact, gave me six letters about Hardyal that their professor had exchanged. They, and uh, newspapers of that period extensively have covered it. So the United States was, uh, uh, and I'm writing a book about it, by the way, about the United States role in India's freedom movement, which has totally been ignored by us. Uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating story of how America came in at various levels. Uh, I can go on, but <laughs> that's yeah, about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also invite questions from the audience. If you want to ask something, you can write in the chat box or you can let us know that you want to uh, ask a question. Uh, sir, uh, uh, would you want to ask a question or any comment from your side? Well, if, I think we should give a chance to the audience, but if uh, nobody is coming up, I can put one right. question to, oh, there is somebody, yeah. Pramod uh, Krishna, do you? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I have a question. First of all, congratulations. That was a brilliant talk. Uh, my question is very simple. Why can't we now make this a part of uh, our curriculum uh, to teach our students that this has been, uh, you know, the history of India, the freedom movement, rather than going by the just the traditional uh, whatever, uh, we, you know, we, we hear about uh, a couple of figures, and uh, it's uh, given to us you know, on a plate, and we swallow it. But uh, this was a completely different. Um, uh, you enlightened us, and it was really wonderful. Uh, thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, just very quickly, uh, the name of Hardyal came to me in passing. You know, even I, as a student in India, never heard of him. And uh, once I started investigating the Indian freedom movement, I realized the importance of this individual. And now you'll be happy to know on 15th August when Prime Minister spoke at uh, Redford, uh, the portrait of Hardyal was right under him. They had in fact picked out people from each state and Delhi was represented by Hardyal. And around the same time, uh, next to uh, the Mathra Road, a major 14 acre park has been dedicated to Hardyal. So he's coming back and uh, the story of Netaji is already out there. His statue is uh, at India Gate. The, alternative story or the sort of uh, multi uh, 
level story of uh, multi-structured story of Indian freedom movement is going to be part of our education system going forward. We will not ignore the unsung heroes anymore. And the consulate is doing a great job, I must say. Wonderful. Good to hear that. And congratulations sir. once again. Thank you. Thank sir, you, Pramod. Sir, sir, can I, I uh, to, yeah, ask yeah, a please. question, please? Yes, 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 please. Uh, please. I'm Colonel Tevatia, and since I'm driving, I'm listening to this entire talk. So, actually, I'm very emotional about this subject. That such a great person, the only we read in the textbook was Hardial Singh M.A., who was a brilliant person and who was killed by Britishers. This is all I knew about Hardial before listening to your talk today. So I would I would say echo my uh, producer who asked this question. It should be part of our textbooks. We have tons of material on so many people which we really don't want to learn about. But we have very little about the people like Hardialji and this. I would say I want to thank Indian Consulate for organizing it and thank you, sir, for your speech. It has been great. It has been motivating. And we really thank everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Varanji. Any questions? Yes, uh, Dr. Lal, we have received one question from Mr. Abhishek and he has asked that was Lala Hardayal in touch with Ras Bihari Bose? Uh, of course. Did Mm. Did the Ghadar movement in the U.S. inspire Ras Bihari Bose to form the Indian National Army with the Japanese help? Yes, th this is all the sa same people. They were working across continents. They were uh, secretly in touch with each other. And the revolutionary movement is a parallel track of the Indian freedom movement. And it contributed to India's freedom. And uh, I mean, uh, we have already had a lecture on Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, Ras Bihari Bose, Indian National Army, INA, and how that uh, turned the tables. So there is a direct connect, in fact, between the Gadar of 1857, the Gadar party and Azad Hind Faj. This is the parallel track. What we know is about the civil disobedience movement, which also had a massive impact uh, on the British empire. But the critical thing was the genius of Hardial of finding out how could dismantle the British empire by taking away the respect for the British king in the Indian, British Indian army. And that transformed the whole scene. Good evening, sir. Sir, I am Aradha Priya from India State, Jharkhand City, Devghar. Sir, uh, I, I want to ask a question that after the death of Lala Hardaya Singh, sir, who controls the Gadda party? So, uh, thank you. So nice to hear your voice. Uh, Lala Hardial had moved away from the Gadar party after the First World War. He was indirectly working with the revolutionaries through the Arra Samaj movement. Uh, most of the Gadar patriots were arrested, several of them in America, they went to jail, and uh, quite a few of them went to Kalapani in India. The systematic dismantling of the Gadar party happened after the First World War, and it continued. As I said, MI6, the British intelligence agency, was employed. And eventually, David Petrie, the guy who found the link of Hardeyal to the bombing in Delhi, was the man who became Winston Churchill's head of British MI5. So, you know, these are the same people working against us. Thank you, sir, for your in inspiring lecture to us. Sir, actually, I am a student of class 9th and uh, I studied in Gita Devi Dehavi Public School. Very good. Thank so you. Nice Thank you, Arathya. Somebody wants to know about the family of Lalaji. Yes, uh, uh, Hardial was married in India. He had one daughter. She went up to study in Allahabad University, completed a BA. She got married to a barrister uh, and they had four kids. Uh, the eldest of them is in direct touch with me, Ms. Shubdeal. She's 95. And when I wrote the book on Lala Hardial, the first copy I presented to her. And very recently, I wrote a book on Delhi in the 
uh, era of revolutionaries, and she was present there talking about her grandfather, who she never met. So, Dr. Lal, as you can see in the chat box, we are receiving a lot of comments, and yes. uh, they are all very emotional in nature. It appears that you have actually, you know, touched a chord, and people are really liking uh, the talk. And, yeah, the uh, story of Hardeyal is such. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. So we have one question from Mr. Babu Subramaniam, who has yes. asked that, why did he return to London when the British were particularly after him? So Bhardial uh, had a mind which is very difficult to fathom. So after the First World War, he wrote a book about the greatness of the British Empire. And that totally, you know, completely ruined his reputation within the revolutionary movement, because this was the man who was in the forefront and the leadership of the revolutionary system, and then suddenly he turns around. But it was a magic trick, you know. He was trying to play a game, a game so deep that the British could be fooled by it. Uh, he always did that. He was three, four steps ahead of everyone else, and he was thinking out of the box continuously. So his trip to England, his visit to England was to be in direct touch with whatever was happening in India, because living in Sweden, he couldn't do much. He was living in Gothenburg in a small village, and there was not much that could happen in those circumstances. So his connect with uh, India could only happen if he moved to a uh, place like London. And he also wanted to complete his PhD. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we are still receiving questions and comments, but uh, we are running out of time. So we have, uh, sir, do you want to, uh, say something or ask a question. Well, thank you, Dr. Lal. What can I say? A brilliant talk. That thank is you. what I would, that is how I would define your conversation this morning here in New York and evening in India. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, it has given a lot of food for thought for uh, all our friends from the Indian American community and scholars and our friends joining from far and wide, as to how we can individually and as a community do more to resurrect such legacies, such rich history, and not only just resurrect, but how do we pass on? That's very important. I see the Indian American community, we are very proud of their achievement. They've done exceedingly well, but I would really encourage them that if they uh, thought a little more, little deeply, little more meaningfully as to how we pass on this beautiful tradition, beautiful heritage that we have, not just to ourselves, the present generation, but also give it across to the future generation. That will be my message to our Indian American community here. And I look forward to doing something when Dr. Lal, you are here, or Absolutely. when uh, with, our, with our community members, especially in Philadelphia, because while, you know, there are several parts of Lala Hardeyal. Uh, he was the founder of Gadar Party. The Gadar Memorial is in San Francisco. Yes. But Northeast United States, which falls in the consular, in the jurisdiction of the consulate, also has so many riveting stories, so many stops in his life. And we would like to celebrate it today and always. So with that, I would like to thank uh, all our uh, audience for your attention, for your participation today. It was a beautiful Saturday morning here in New York. Uh, with that, I would turn it over to Vipul. Thank you, sir. And uh, now we'll go to our Deputy Consul General, Dr. Uh, Varun Jeff, who will deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Vipul. And <clears throat> I would join our Consul General when he says this has indeed been a brilliant talk by Dr. Bhumar Lal. So, Dr. Saab, thank you so much for an insightful exposition, for taking us on an enriching journey into the inspiring life of the genius of the intellectual colossus, the great patriot, Lala Hardeyal. It's indeed been a great delight for us to learn so much more about the varied facets of his life, his intellectual acumen, his personal sacrifice. You can see his daughter immediately after her birth, also his towering personality that you spoke about, and the quintessential role that he played in mobilizing support among the diaspora around the world. Of course, in the United States, but also in other parts of the world, spreading across uh, continents, and for the role that he played in freeing India from the colonial rule. I would also like to thank 
our participants, guests who joined us today on Lala Ji's Punya Tithi, as it happens to be, in paying tributes to him, to his life, his legacy, by remembering his contribution, his supreme sacrifice, and not just of him, but of countless many others like him, the unsung heroes of our freedom movement, who contributed so much to our freedom struggle, for us to breathe in a free India, for us to be able to hold our head high as Indians. I think it's also very apt that we were joined by a large number of members of the Indian American community because Lala Hardial, who is one personality, one patriot, who epitomizes the deep connect between the diaspora and Indian freedom struggle movement. So once again, I thank you all for joining us for this session. And I wish our friends in the United States a very good day ahead and our friends from India a very good evening to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So with this, we will end today's session. And uh, once again, I would uh, thank all our viewers, especially, of course, Dr. Bhuvan Lal, who's, uh, who's been coming to our programs very regularly. And I will request people from our community to spread the word and uh, follow our social media accounts and handles for these programs. We will, do, we will continue to do more such programs on uh, India's freedom struggle and our forgotten heroes. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you, people. Thank you very much.